Okay, we're live and welcome to the latest live stream edition of the Scholar Gypsies. I'm delighted today to have um, Noel Thomas, Seamus Walsh, and Michael Lee Hand. Is that how I pronounce it, Michael? Lande. 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 Sorry, I got the. <laughs> so, yeah. So the three gentlemen here today have. The reason I have I invited them on is they're they're all Connemara men, or they're all out um, uh, in Connemara, and they're running for the Independent Ireland um, group. Let's put it that way for the moment. And basically, two two of the gentlemen here today were ex Fianna Fáil county councillors, and that'd be Seamus Walsh and Noel Thomas. Noel Thomas has been on with us before, so many of my viewers will be familiar with who Noel is. Um, I suppose, Noel, I'll start with you, really. And it's, you know, we've had conversations going back to last summer about some of the things that are going on, on in Ireland. Obviously, they've got to such a point where you've decided to jump ship from the Fianna Fáil party. And I just wanted to guess what was kind of the final straw for you and what was the reason you chose independent Ireland as opposed to going out just independent on your own? Yeah, my good afternoon, Gary. Um, look, I suppose the final straw for me, I suppose, was, was really and truly the way we were treated in relation to the whole uh, Ross Lake inc inc incident. I said we've gone through that in great detail before, just so we won't go back into that again. But, uh, I suppose the one thing that changed since Jerry, since the last time we spoke, is I suppose the only thing that changed since the last time we spoke was that uh, I got a phone call from a pretty senior member in Fianna Fáil who uh, told me. Uh, just only a couple of weeks ago, who, who told me that, uh, you know, not to worry and all, that uh, things will be sorted out and to keep your head down. And uh, if you do that, you know, there'll be no trouble until after the elections. And then after the local elections, you'll, you'll get a, a small suspension. So <laughs> when I heard that, it was kind of like a red rag to a bull, to be honest, Jerry. Like, and I mean, there's no way I was going to put it up with that sort of an insult to, you know, to be treated like that and to be handed a, a disciplinary uh, sentence after the election, like, you know. So... I think that's really what just made me, made me go on the end. But I suppose that you were asking there about Independent Ireland. Well, the reason that I decided to join up with Independent Ireland was, I suppose, that... Well, first of all, I suppose that Michael Fitzmaurice had joined the party himself. And I think Michael Fitzmaurice, for as long as I've known him, and I said, and he sat in the council with me going back years ago. And uh, for as long as I've known him, he would have very similar uh, notions to myself. Like, he's, he's, a, he's, a, he's a rural man, Michael himself. He's a... Uh, oh, he's a... Uh, I said he thinks pretty much the same as as I do. So that's one of the reasons I was kind of steered towards them first. And then when I got into more detail in relation to the party and to their the proposed policies they have and everything else, I suppose it, it, it quickly became aware to me, became fair to me that uh, you know that they were everything that I wanted to see. You know, so in, in, in politics into the future. So then it became an easy enough decision to make. There was nobody else as far as I was concerned that I was going to join other than Independent Ireland. And uh you know, it's essentially like it's all common sense stuff, and that's I think that's the slogan that uh, that has been used all the way through since the foundation of of Independent Ireland Group is common sense, and it's something that unfortunately is not very common in Ireland at the moment. You know, so it's great to see that there is the kind of strength coming behind this party, and it gives you hope that you know that that we will see the changes that we want to see in Ireland into the near future, hopefully. So. That's that's why I joined up with them. I said, you know, I don't know, Jerry, do you want to talk about some of the sort of policy notions or? Well, what I I suppose I want to, I do kind of want to. Well, there's there's two questions, but I I don't I know. I haven't spoken to, or sorry, Seamus, I haven't spoken to you, and I suppose I, I just want to get your take on why you joined as well, and we'll get to Michael because he's a newbie to the political scene, I think. But Seamus, was it a similar reason for you to to um to leave um Fianna Fáil, and did you get that same phone call that? Um, Noel got. Yes, yes. Jerry, pleased to meet you. And thank you. look, thank you. And um, for the opportunity of, of advice and our, our opinions, right? Mm -hmm. Look at I, I'll bring it back this way to you. I'm out in Updraird on the shores of the Carib, where we have, I'm going to say young people mostly, looking for their houses to build in their own area. And it's a very difficult process, a very tedious process. And they have to go through the hoops and they have to do an awful lot of this and an awful lot of that. But back in 1998-99, I actually picked five planning permissions that I was uh, unhappy that they had got better treatment than we had got as locals. Mm. 
Mm. And I went around and spoke to people about them and I told them what I thought about them and I showed them them and I said, look, housing needs here and that not required of these people. But yet, if I was applying, I'd have to have my whole parentage all the way back. And to be like buying a pedigree calf, you'd have to show them everything. <laughs> so you were getting fed up of it. So I put my name forward and a lot of the lads know me like because I'd be kind of a flowery character and have the crack in that. A lot of the lads says that it wasn't serious, but they said, hang on, I was refused planning permission. And I went to build a house. And I have a wife and children. And it went from there and there and there. And that's that's how that's how I went into politics, right? Now, as I came through, the SACs were coming in. And Sheila de Valera was the minister. Eamon O'Keeve was the junior minister in charge of Douglas. And we thought we'd have influence on him. So I rejoined from the Independent and rejoined back into Fianna Fáil, although I'd always been a Fianna Fáil member until I ran Independent automatic suspension then. You see, the thing about Fianna Fáil is there's a lot of pomp and ceremony, right? And it's a lot like the king in a suit of clothes. There isn't really a suit of clothes. They're actually naked. And we play along with it because there's unity in numbers and there's strength in numbers. And, you know, you swallow a lot of pride when you're in Fianna Fáil for the sake of remaining in the club. The councillors are a very decent clique now. Well, I, I, I want to ask you a question there, Noel. You'd like to be with them because they are decent people and they're good. But what we're being absolutely from Dublin, we're being peddled the greatest stripe. Nothing can be changed, right? Nothing can be looked into. And I mean, if you look at it all over Europe over the hundreds of years, like, like continents have changed, you know, time zones have changed. Everything has changed. Like, But simple little rules on the shores of the Carib cannot change. They're there forevermore. I mean, the Roman Empire fell. But the SFEs cannot be touched on. And we're being ruled from Germany. That's what I yeah, feel. I... We're being ruled from Germany. You know, and there's a lot of things. Like the farmers, for example, right? The farmers have to destock cattle now because of the carbon process and all the methane gases that are the cows that produce. All the time, there's lorries and lorries of, of, of deer being let out into the culture forests uh, for a playground for the, for the Europeans, the Germans, and for the other people that are letting them out there. So, like, where I'm saying to you, there's a one law for or one in planning and another law for the other. That's what I found. Now, as a councillor, and as we got through it, we saw there were systems and, you know, and that, okay, this is why this happened. And there's a logical reason for it. Yet, you'll still come across the other one where preference is given and somebody gets a soft touch and they seem to have this little. So from that point of view, there's frustration that you see somebody getting something that the ordinary man wouldn't get. And when you come to your Fianna Fáil TD with that, they tell you it's best not to be talking about that. You're best to fo follow your own course and try and get your own cases put through. Don't be commenting on ones that went through because you're really spoiling it for somebody else in a way. Okay. That is in the planning, right? Yeah. Now, you, just let me let me hold you. There, let me hold you on there now a second, yeah. um, because you know planning is interesting. Like planning, that's definitely, you know, there's definitely issues there, and you can see in the planning that state on the rules that. If we take it to today, yes. um, Shams, exactly, yeah. state owned property follows no rules now on the immigration laws because, uh, you know, for emergency accommodation, all that. And you found that with Ross, mm -hmm. you know, Ross Lake and stuff. So I, I, I'm of the opinion this is this, this election is going to be for a lot of people on bigger issues. Like, and I'm not saying planning isn't a, a huge issue, it, it certainly is, but. I want to take you back to something that um, Noel said, because the Fianna Fáil party seemed to carry, try to choreograph a narrative to keep you quiet till after the election. So it didn't basically, I suppose, cost the party votes. But one thing I want to ask you is, is the selection process for Fianna Fáil a part of the problem? Because at the common, our today's type of candidates that are going to political parties, are they kind of being vetted at a, a HQ level before yes. they're allowed, like it's not it's not the grassroots commons that are you know, picking we'll say a, a, she a Seamus Walsh or an old Thomas, and I put it to you maybe today, is if the, if the three of ye had never been elected before, would ye stand a chance of being, getting through the Fianna Fáil selection process today? Can I answer that? Yeah. Well, just, just specifically, Jerry, if you mind yeah. the answer. Yeah, 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 yeah. I had uh, first hand uh, dealing with this myself. So going back, the first time I, I wanted to run in the elections was back in 2009. Now, at that particular time, Fianna Fáil were not that high in numbers of councillors on the ground. Right? Mm -hmm. they, were, they were 
just kind of getting a bit weak at the time, right? So in 2009, I would decided to continue on with this uh, new system they had introduced. So instead of having going to convention and letting the actual members of the Commons select who was going forward for the election, they introduced an interview process. Now, I took part in that interview myself. I'd done it out in the Galway Hotel in 2009, and uh, I'd done extremely well on the interview. And, and as I said, I was very happy coming out of it. But I... I can't, I can't go into the, the the exact details of it, Jerry, right? Because I had I actually had inside information in relation to what happened at the time, right? And the process, let's just say, wasn't that great, right? And I said yeah, I had first hand information coming to me, so I, I knew exactly what what was happening. But anyway, I it turns out I wasn't selected through that process, and somebody else was. So then those elections took place in 2009, Fianna Fáil did not do extremely well again in relation to that right so then 2014 they decided to change their system again so they went back to the old style system again where there was conventions held and the candidate was selected by the members on the ground again and from that particular day then Fianna Fáil soared in numbers in relation to councillors again and that was the difference and, and and what I can say to you is you were talking about local elections here in relation to people being handpicked where we have gone wrong over the last number of years, is that the it's the candidates for the doll that have been handpicked. Okay, and that's where the process has gone really wrong, and we can see the really see the effects of that now because we've got a whole bunch of people in the doll at the moment. Like I said who have become completely disconnected, and that is where the disconnect has happened mm-hmm. because said they are not, they had not been selected from the ground really and truly, and that's mm-hmm. that's where the problem is. Mm-hmm. No, and well, Seamus, do you have anything to add there? But what I'd add there is, I'd have to be very respectful to the to the Fianna Fáil people, and I'm gone from them now, right, so I'm not playing up to them, you know. But I would say that when I did want to be become a member, come in from independent, you know, the councillors were very supportive, and I was I was brought in. Now, as one or two of the councillors didn't like my independent twang, you know, from, from when I was independent, I was critical of the party in that. But I was critical at the time of the waste management strategy in Galway, the time of the incinerators and all that, and I was negative. I, when... Development charges were, were brought in for planning. I was against them. Mm-hmm. And Fianna Fáil, as a party, brought them in at the time. And it, it was frustrating for me to see them bringing it in because they had done away with the grants for, for your first-time builder. They had done away with every kind of support for young people trying to build a house. And then they came with development fees, which made it impossible. And if you look at last year, there was a derogation given to try and help young couples to build their houses where development fees were dropped for a year. So maybe 15 years later, that's when Fianna Fáil have realised the error of their ways and they've realised the development charges are, are aiding the crisis, if you like, in housing. So back to the Fianna Fáil selection thing. So from the fact that I had strong enough views and I was rocking the boat a bit, there were probably some of the councillors felt I was a pain in the arse and they didn't really want me there. But I have to say that once I became a member and I was selected every time and nobody tried to stop me running, even though I had those strong views. And I don't want to be unfair to them now because I've chosen. But what I will say to you is the Michal Martin thing about the Ross Lake. Like, Ross, Ross Cahill has a Fianna Fáil coming and a very strong Fianna Fáil coming and very serious, nice people. And those people attend the meeting and their Eamon O'Quive would be there as their local TD. Noel Thomas was born, bred and reared in Ross Cahill. And I come there as well with the meeting, right? But there was... Families that come and that have the envelope from home because the father couldn't come and the brother couldn't come. And they'd have their membership in that. Mm-hmm. And what's really hurting me now, and I'm glad I'm getting the chance to say it, what's really hurting me about Ross Lake is the people that came to those meetings with their 20 euros and became members and paid their membership every year and didn't want to lose it, the way they were let down by the party over the Christmas, mm-hmm. the way that Michal Martin turned his back on them, and the way he could jolt Damon O'Keefe into turning his back on them. Like, I would have expected Damon O'Keefe to go door to door to those people. Well, then, look, yeah, no, I would too, but like... And, and you know, that's me now, and I'm saying it, I'm not saying it for a cheap shot, because I'm not running for Ireland, I'm running for the council, I'm just saying it. Look, I just felt that yeah. people have been so loyal to Fianna Fáil for the 20 years I've been in it, and how good they were to meet, come to meetings and to pay their membership and to stand and do the national collection, to buy the tickets every year for the national draw, and to think that when 
a Green Party decides, Roderick O'Gorman decides he's going to do something which is very, very wrong and put 72 males into a totally area which they should never be. Do I, if, they were, if they were from Dublin or anywhere else, they shouldn't be in that hotel because it wasn't fit for them. Well, and, 100%. and then Fianna Fáil turn their back on the people and try to impose that on them. That's bad enough. And then Michal Merton comes along and tackles the two councillors that actually stood by their people, which is what any party would like their councillors to do. So from there, that's where I see the problem. But it gave me a great chance and it gave me the strength to look at myself and say, do I want to be in this party anymore? And I don't. And I have to be honest about it as well. My family didn't want me in the party for the last couple of years. But well, I, I, I can tell you, I can tell you, I don't want any in the party for my own person. Is the in the in, and I'm not a polit like I'm not as affiliated with any political party or politics or anything like that. But I like a lot of people in Galway. I like I'm a bit of a political junkie on when elections come around and stuff like that traditionally. But I would have said to you um, just that you know. Michal Martin has had a habit of airlifting cat people in from other parties to Fianna Fáil that suited the HQ agenda. If you look at Stephen Donnelly, he's not a traditional Fianna Fáil character. Or even, we'll say locally, um, we'll say well, locally, uh, Councillor uh, Keevney, he'd be up in our yeah. area. He came mean? in from the... Jerry, with your permission, now yeah. that you mentioned Stephen Donnelly, yeah. he was a brilliant orator when he was in opposition. And he was very... very he was slow enough on the ground now. He was hard enough to find during the COVID crisis and he didn't really pick it up. I mean, if you looked at it, the Minister for Health, to me, should have been at the forefront. But Varadkar was leading the charge on the, on the COVID crisis. And I, I just felt that, that, you know, you have a Minister of Health, Minister for Health, who was so vocal when he was against Fianna Fáil, but now that he's in Fianna Fáil, he seems to be being quietened. That's my well, opinion. It, well, that seems to be the case. Well, you can see, you've seen personally with the way... I would say the media and the heads of your own party and the, the other government parties dealt with your um, representation of the people in terms of Ross Lake, how, how, you know, the wheel turns against you if you fall out of the narrative any bit. So that's the way it always has been, Jerry. And I look at, you're talking about Stephen Donnelly there. I mean, Stephen Donnelly was one of the most critical people of Fianna Fáil over the years. But as I said to you, don't, you, you, you said it yourself, he's no problem. You have Martin putting out his hands and bringing them under the wing when he wants support, you see. That's, that's what it's all about. To be very honest with you, Fianna Fáil has turned into a party. It's not, you know, Joseph, it's not just Fianna Fáil. It's fine Gale as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, and I accept that. I accept no, that. I as well. There's no point cutting ourselves there. But, uh, I mean, they're all happy as long as they can to take in anybody, as long as it means that they still hold power. And and, and it's something you're going to see again, repeated again uh, this time, Jerry, because they, there's no way that anybody can tell me that we shouldn't have had a general election called on us at this stage now. But yes, well, well, yeah, we're not going to see it like. And I bet you any money, they will stretch this out right till the end again. And they won't care what cost. But as long as they keep themselves in their jobs for as long as they can, that's well, that's the way it seems to be. Well, yeah, I think you're, 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 you're pro I think they have certain things they want to get over the line and they're before they go and it's being pushed from outside of the country i'd say stuff like the hate speech legislation and like but i think the longer it goes the worse it is going to be for them like in terms of because yeah and right if you so because now i just want to ask michael a question there because i've been yeah. concentrating there on the two um elected county councils yeah. michael tell me now is that did you get dropped in your head to get into politics or what was your reason for 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 joining independent ireland <laughs> Well, I, 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 my own background, we were big fan of fathers all our yeah. lives. Okay. And I was going to, for the last 20 years, I joined up myself and I was going to all the meetings all the time. And I found for probably a year, year and a half, that there was nothing being done on the ground for the ordinary person. I'm a postman myself and I talk to people every day about little issues, small issues that I think that could be solved very easily. But when I'd be going to the local common meetings, I'd have no representative there in the county council to represent me. And after a while, you just say, "Why? what am I doing going to these meetings? Mm. And I made, we were outside. It was a terrible night one night. And we said, it was four or five of us. And I told them, there's no good for me coming here. For the people which I talk to every day. And they asked me, when you, when you have your common meetings, will you bring this up? And they were so... 
there was no county councillor there for me or for the local people to talk to them about their problems. So I decided on that night that it was time for me to part with Fianna Fáil. Mm -hmm. and that is my... Yeah, and let me ask you another question. There's just a following question there because you said you're a postman. What, and you know, it, it's harder and harder to get to meet people nowadays with technology and everybody's on their phones and all that kind of thing. What would be the number one issue you'd say is on the doorstep when you're dropping off the post with them people out in Connemara? No. At the moment. The by roads are in very, very, very bad conditions. There's potholes everywhere. And that is the big issue that I find that they're coming to me with. <clears throat> and tell me this, is there, you know, <clears throat> you can get in echo chambers and I can get in them myself because of some, you know, some of the way I look at the world. Um, is immigration as big, a pro is, big is immigration going to be a big issue in Connemara as I kind of think it's going to be, generally speaking, around Ireland? that, you know, the policies we have adopted on asylum seekers and refugees seem to be unlimited numbers to be allowed to come into the country. Do you think that issue, that specific issue is going to raise its head in the local elections? And maybe go back to you, Noel. Yeah, um, it's definitely, from what I can hear, I mean, that's one of the biggest issues that's, that seems to be out there at the moment. Look at Michael said it himself there. Look at the one a very common issue is that we're always dealing with this condition of roads because Connemara being Connemara, it's you know, we're, we're, we're in boggy ground. So even when we do a road up, it only lasts uh, if maybe a few years and you know, it's, it's crumbling again. Like, you know, there's just the nature of the grounds, nothing we can do about that. But it's uh, that's that's going to be an ongoing battle always. But I suppose, look at the other issue, and Seamus has touched on it earlier on there as well, is planning is a serious issue in Connemara all the time. Right. And and it's uh, in Connemara South. Let's take for particular is it's backland development is one of the biggest issues that we have there. I don't just to explain to that quickly to Jerry. It's a case of that uh, okay, an awful lot of people living in Connemara who have a little bit of land, whatever. So they've used the road frontage that they had in order to to for themselves and their families to build houses already. And there may be other members who still need planning and they've no road frontage left. So then automatically up until until we done the recent county development plan, there was no policy in place to allow for a backland development. There was years ago, but as I said, they, they, they done away with it. And uh, as I said, we finally managed to get a policy introduced again for that. But uh, it's still very difficult to get it. So what, what the city today is kind of one of the one of the biggest issues in relation to planning in, in South Connemara at the moment, as I said, because most of the, 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 the road footage has been used up. But uh, again, then I would say definitely the whole migration issue is, is, is serious in the whole county, not just Connemara. But uh, no, everybody can see it. You know, yeah, they, like, like, I think that's fair. You like they can, yeah. Well, you can see. I mean, even like go to Cairo, that the, there's their move. There's migrants moving into hotels out there now recently again too. There's there's loads of hotels around all of uh, Connemara, Peacocks. There's uh, there's there's many more. There's Clifton as well. There's all they're everywhere. So like, what we're going to really see is a massive impact in relation to the tourism business when it comes to the summer. And uh, I don't think people are really aware, but as much yet. Because you see, if we went back to last year, you know, a lot of the tourists that came to to Connemara would have been booked in from the year before that, right? So they kind of the accommodation was still there for them. But like a lot of these places are not going to be available this year to book into, and uh, and and any accommodation that's left is going to be such an astronomical price anyway that you know that, that they may not be able to afford it. So I think this year is going to tell a lot in relation to that. But as I said, it's I think. Even apart from that, right? That's, that that would have a lot of an impact on on the local economy, say over the over the summer period and everything. But on top of that, then as well, it's just the hurt that people are feeling, and that's yeah. hurt woman in relation to the amount of money that they're seeing. You know, that's being just thrown around now by the the government to to fund all the migrants coming in here to fund all their needs. You know, they're walking in here, they're 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 getting all the medical care they need and 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 everything else handed to them, education wise, bus services, you name it. It's all been given to them. I mean, we we yeah, but but let we me have... ask let me ask you a question there, Noel, and maybe ask I'll I'll move it to Seamus and get your opinion as well. Is let me ask a pretty direct question on it on this whole area. Would the three of you be in favour of a pause on asylum seekers and refugee incoming until we get a uh, for a period of time until we fully understand and process what we've already taken in because one of the worries for me as a 
you know, just an ordinary person, is that this is a generate we're creating not just a problem for today and tomorrow, but a generational problem in terms of the balance between the indigenous part population and the we'll say the the immigrant population coming in. That 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 that, that we've lost the balance there. Or would you guys see it that way? It's 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 it's, it's we're too late for a pause, Jerry. Yeah. Right? I, that's that's the problem that's here. Like, and people say, no, we have stopped what's happening now. That everything will be okay. It won't be, because like we can see already, the amount of people we have here living in substandard accommodations facilities all over the country already. Mm -hmm. So a pause just isn't good enough. You actually have to fix the problem that's there. Okay, <laughs> but we need to stop it first, Noel. Is what I, my point is, like, and I'll bring it back to Independence Ireland, and I, I'll maybe bring Seamus in because yeah, I, well. um, as well, is that. I don't see any policy in, I didn't see it on the website that one of the policy statements of the independent Ireland is to stop um, immigration, you know, the asylum seeker and refugee uh, um, immigration into the country to stop it. Like I said, pause, no, your language was stronger than mine, which is, so is like, is that a policy of the independent Ireland group or are you going to formulate policies in that regard, Seamus? Well, thank you. From my discussions with Independent Ireland, it's basically, I've seen the outline of the policies and they fall in line with the way I think. With regard to the immigration policy, my personal way of thinking about it is we cannot take in any more people. And if we do take in people, it should be when the others that are to go, go, right? There is no way that 4 million people can be diluted down to become an six million people with 33 percent of them being non-nationals i mean we're talking look in connemara it's a general principle that especially if you're buying a house in a new building estate that you have to prove your competency in the irish language to be allowed to buy the house from a builder that's the general thing now there's not enough houses being built etc and the reason for that is and the councillors put it in there and the government wanted to put it in there because of the act in Tanga back in 2003 i think it was right but that they wanted to give identification more antis to Tonga, as they say to themselves, to recognize the tongue. So we're protecting the Irish language while we're diluting our population. And let's be fair about it. I have a son of jockey, he's out in Australia, and he was told, you're one of the last lads getting in because we have enough of jockeys now, thank you. And the same with any other trade. If you see Australia, they'll open up their borders to people that they need. And when they don't need any more, they close their borders. And that's logical. And you see, it's one, uh, going back to the Michal Merton thing again, it was very frustrating to hear, and Helen McEntee, the way they twisted it, they're spin doctors. Like, they're not true people the way they came across, right, to me. No, my, not to me. Right? Because the way they came across, they were putting us that we were against migration. Not at all. I know people that are working with countries like from the Philippines. They're highly respected, beautiful people, working hard. It's not a thing. They've come into the proper channels. They've got their visas. They're needed. There was a, it's not for them. These people, we're not talking about those. We're talking about people that arrive into Dublin and, okay, we'll say they haven't got a passport. Just say. The people said they're throwing, they tore them up and all that. I'm being told that they could even be in their pockets and they don't have to show them to. There's no law to force them to search their pockets, we'll say, for example. So there's people getting in. There are people that have criminal records that have got in. We've been told they were vetted. They couldn't have been vetted because they didn't know who they were. How can you vet somebody you don't know? How do you vet somebody that came in from this? Look, I, like, I, I, I was never a person on the vet I, that was particularly strong. I don't they were lies we were told. Yeah. And they were told because... to classify people. And they're the same lies that were used to make demons out of Noel Thomas and myself in the Rascal thing. We, yeah. never, you know, we never did a bit of uh, negativity in the Rascal thing at all, except we put it forward. And what we put forward, if you give me this second, because it's the truth, there was a circular from Galway County Council sent to the IPAS. And it told them that there was no facilities for people and not basically told them not to send them. And the reason, the storage hadn't been vetted for them. Now, that hotel in Roscahal is on the banks of a river, which is an SAC river. They're within 100 metres of an SAC. You wouldn't get planning permission if you went looking for it yourself in it. Not for a storage of that standard. You wouldn't get it. Not there. They don't have footpaths. They didn't have lighting. They didn't have accommodation properly for them. They didn't have the roads to serve them. They didn't have a bus service to, to, to them. There wasn't a shop within four miles of them, right? It was no place to put any poor creature. Not to think, not go back then and say, did you have, just pick this. You have a lady coming home from work at night 
after my working hour in the evening, dark night in the winter time. 72 males in the boring where she's driving in. That she doesn't know where they came from, she doesn't know what they are, she's meeting them, she doesn't know what to expect. In an area that's not zoned for that type of behaviour or that type of thing. And Eamon O'Keefe made a comment that people don't have the right to choose who lives in their community, but I reject that totally. People have the right to comment on it. And people Absolutely. Was the third, but we weren't allowed to. And when we did this, right, and, and Helen McEntee, the way she put it out that we wouldn't cooperate with police and all this stuff, and that they thought that elected representatives should do this and should do that. Did they ask us, had we cooperated? Of course we had. I spent an hour and 45 minutes in the barracks in Octorard, as I said, being heavily questioned. And then one evening, I'm, I'm living on a farm as well, even though it's not my main activity. And I was just doing a few jobs up in the shed and the car pulled up. And two lads got out and they showed me their warden cards. They were two guards An impromptu visit, and no problem. I asked them to one tea and brought them into the house and all that. And I was totally managed them and I spoke for two hours. But Helen McEntee will come out and say, councillors aren't cooperating with the Gardaí and this is atrocious. They're putting the spin on it. And then our own party leader will dance to her tune. Uh, when I heard, when I heard Lisa Chambers coming out and saying that was a go- the hate crime, which, crime thing was, was sponsored by Helen McEntee and that they're partners in government and that she voted on it and didn't even read it, but just voted on it with the party. Now, are we electing people to go to the All to vote through other parties' agenda to keep themselves in power so that they can keep their plum jobs? Well, this is the like this is the this is the problem. Like, do you know what I mean? And now I'm going to like I'm going to push back a little here now, and it's not meant as, as a jab in, in particular. Do, but do, but, yeah. but well, let's put. I want to frame something to you now because I know what you're getting involved with in Independent Ireland. It sounds like it sounds principally good, but uh, like I'm somebody that likes to push at the details. But the media have framed you two guys in a particular way, in a heavy way. And Noel, you found this with Brian Dobson on RT recently yeah. as well. Um, now I pick up my newspaper uh, Examiner yesterday, and Independent Ireland have announced that Kieran Mullally, 27 years in RT, is the candidate for Midlands Northwest. So just on the optics front, have you how independent are you to talk and stuff like that? You know, he's going to be a candidate for that for us here. I don't know much about Kieran. He could be a good guy, but like the optics of it for me when I'm looking at it as somebody that's kind of sent because I like I, I do want something good to come out of the ground, the foundations of the country, to replace what you're talking about. How do you feel, or do you have input on decisions like that? No, well, obviously we don't have input on on, on decisions like that. I mean, we, we couldn't have really and truly. But uh, I let's let's put it this way, Jerry. I put it as if you you looking at me say the first time I ever came out, or or, let's, or actually no, let's let's just change that. Actually, let's just let's go back and say that if I hadn't spoken to the likes of yourself, say going back a long time ago, or come out openly on on certain issues, you know, that we're against the grain according to Fianna Fáil, like, right? And right. then all of a sudden, then today, I had decided that I was going to join in with Independent Ireland. Mm-hmm. Now, surely to God, that would raise a lot of red flags with you as well. You'd have to say, you know, where is this like going? He's just jumping ship or whatever, like, and you know, just trying to save his ass for for the next election or whatever, like, right? But well, I know, I know that's not true from the deal we've yeah. had in the nine months. That's yes, why I'm asking you the question. Yeah, but, but the point I'm trying to make on that, Jerry, is like, you see, like, put it this way, you, you talk about Kieran there a minute ago. Now, I know myself, I, I've had an awful lot of, of, of media play interviews done over, over this, particularly over the last six months or so anyway. But uh, there's, 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 there's people who are easy to deal with in the media and there are people that aren't. And there's good and bad in every organisation. And as I said... So I know some of the people in RTE, you know, the finest people you could you could ever sit down with. The Irish Independent, for example, there's some fantastic journalists in it. Same with same with, with the Guy Bay FM or the Connacht Tribune or any any other media outlet you want to pick. You know, there's always going to be good and bad in those groups. And I suppose people have different views on different things as well. And it's unfortunate though that when it comes to the media, that you know that they push their views stronger some people than than, than others. Because like if you're going to be doing an interview in the media, you should actually you know be non-biased completely. So I said, when you see the likes of Brian Dobson the other day and he tackled me, 
And you know, first of all, he, he, he was nice and talking about you know, the reasons why I left Fianna Fáil or whatever, and that was all fine. But then he quickly rushed into the whole uh, idea, you know, of the, yeah, the, the, the yeah. issue again. And, and I don't mind. I said it to him. I saw him straight out, and I stuck to my word on it. You know, that's as far as I'm concerned, that the vast majority of the Ukrainians who can all that come into this country were not fleeing war. They come in here as economic migrants, and I stand by that, no problem. But what was quite amazing about it, now my dad wasn't happy to hear me saying that. He started cutting in and saying, but no, and he said, you know, these people have been invaded by the Russians and all. But that's only a small part of, of, of Ukraine. It'd be like me fleeing uh, Galway back at the time of the Troubles in the North, you know? There, there wouldn't be much difference in, in, in the two. But I said, but the, fact, the, the amazing thing about that was uh, two days later, the department make an announcement and they come out with the announcement to say that the amount of Ukrainians seeking asylum here in this country has reduced by 66% yeah, since they dropped the, the, the welfare payments. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. What does that tell you? I mean, he's like, well, it tell, well, it's like everything else. And I do, I want to get back to the point on yeah. what I'm making about Mullally because here's the reason I'm making it. I'm not trying to, ha I'm not purposely trying to have a go at independent Ireland, but you take it like the, the way I look at it from, you know, just the overview is we'll take in Galway City, like, as far as I'm aware, Ali Turner has dropped out of Galway Bay FM and yeah. he is going to be joining Fine Gael. You have Cynthia Nimuraku, who's um, announced as an MEP candidate for Fianna Fáil in the MEP elections. Mm -hmm. And we have Kieran Mullally. All I'm saying is it's the same when, when you're looking at when you're looking at something like that from the outside, you're thinking the questions that come to me is. Right, why are they doing it? It's the same playbook, name recognition locally, you know, uh, face. Yeah, you've got to imagine, yeah. Jerry, just, just, just stop me on that for one second. You've got to imagine yeah. that, right? So here it was, three of us joining in with a new party, a brand new yeah, party. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We are joining in the in the hope that this party will be what, what we what we what we envision it to be in the future, like right? Yeah, and I know that. I like I accept that as true. And and so we cannot stay you know, come before you here in an interview today and tell you that yeah. you know, this is exactly yeah, yeah. going to be it's yeah. all you for us as well. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. but all we can do, you see, as I said, is look at the policies that they're putting forward and hope that they'll stand by those policies. Because what I've seen so far in relation to it is all good. And that's what mm -hmm. I'm hoping to be to be a part of into the future and like you asked there a minute ago just quickly about the migration policies that are there so the, the stance from independent ireland in relation to the the whole uh, migration thing is is it and they're right in saying it like we actually have pretty strict migration policies in place in this country but we are not enforcing them, enforcing them and that's okay. the problem is if we actually enforce the policies we have we wouldn't have the issue we have today you know so that's well, the, it's uh, like it bring. Uh, and Seamus, can I get your view on that? What we were just talking about there. Well, on the media, I think the media were fed a different line. They were sold a pup completely by Fianna Fáil, Fine Gael, and the Greens. And I, 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 I don't think the media were critical enough of Michal Merton, Helen McEntee, and Eamon Ryan. Because a lot of Eamon Ryan's utterances at the beginning of all the crisis around Christmas, our crisis in Roscal, you know, we were scaremongering, you know, people were afraid, why were, and then a month later, oh, people have genuine concerns and people are afraid and there's genuine fear in the community and we must do something about that fear. That's the same fear we were talking about a month before that when we were deemed as racist. Yeah. So I, and the Helen McEntee thing, I cannot understand the type of people that are electing on. Are they listening to her? She came out the other day and she said that she'd formulate a policy based on her advice from the Gardaí. Now, would it not be that she'd formulate the policy and that she'd no. advise the Gardaí on the policy? Well, we've seen her get dissected by, like, to be fair, there's I'm, a, I'm, I'm a... There's something very wrong when, when, when you hear a Minister for Justice saying that she's going to take direction and impose the policies that the people that are working for her want it. Would she not say she'd do it for the people that elected her? And the electors and what they want. Well, well we're, we're, what's becoming clear is the head of this, the, you, the head of all this is, you know, they're being informed by a special advisor class, uh, an NGO class. And it's almost like they're being, not to be disrespectful, they're being fed lines and they don't actually, like, understand what they're doing. Like uh, I really don't don't understand. It's obvious they don't understand what they're doing because if yeah. they understood what they were saying, they wouldn't say it. F yeah. No. It. And if I had a problem with the media, I think they weren't hard enough on the ministers to say. Oh, they didn't. 
Well, like I, I'd probably be on a strong, like I'd be stronger on the faults of the media. Now you might say I would be, but like in terms of their culpability might be equal or more to, than the political class is that it's definitely a, it seems to me an incestuous relationship on driving certain ideologies into the country. And, and, and I don't just mean immigration. I might bring up one, which, you know, as as to one that's topical, where do you stand, uh, Seamus, on the hate speech legislation? You know, I know it's not a local issue, but well, I think people, yes, people would like it. to know. Yes, Jerry. Well, look at it this way. The hate speech or the hate crime legislation, as they call it, that is not passed yet, so it's not in yet. But look what they have done to us in our area over the past three months. Imagine if they had those extra powers, what they'd have done to us. So, and that's the point I made a second ago to you, or a couple of minutes ago to you, about Lisa Chambers on an RTE programme stating that she had voted for the hate crime legislation, that it had been sponsored by Fine Gael, and that she voted for it without having read it, because she was in government with Fine Gael. Right? Mm. Imagine the consequences and for the people back in Mayo that elected that person, well, they didn't actually, like she got into the Senate. She didn't make her doll seat. But for the for the Fianna Fáil party that put her in the Senate, what are the consequences? And what are the consequences for the people in Mayo as well, for the representatives and for the people of Galway that voted for the hate crime legislation without having read it? And now they're rolling back on it and saying, oh, there's parts of this we're not happy with. Oh, my God. I voted for this three months ago. Oh, my God. Why didn't they put their hands and say, we made a mistake here. Well, this is it. Like, I, I dissected this legislation with a barrister two, four days ago. And, like, one of the things is on that hate speech legislation, and, Noel, I might get your thoughts on this because you've you've gone through this, and I, and I brought you up in the interview, was if you, ref like, one one of the, um, on the search warrants on the hate speech laws, one of the, one of the, um, um, penalties is on a search warrant, anyone on your property, phone, Computer device can be taken, but if you refuse to hand over the passcode to your phone, or anyone on your property refuses to do that, you face a, a fine of five thousand euros, or up to twelve months in prison. Now, that's almost like Orwellian in, in um, craziness to me. And how do you see it? It's, it is absolute and utter madness, uh, Jerry. Is what it is. I mean, to hand over those sort of powers to to, to people is just it's scandalous, like. I mean, you can't. It, it means that you have no protection whatsoever as a citizen in this country after it. You say, I think in Scotland, after, if I'm not mistaken, I, I, I'm pretty sure I read this only yesterday, I think it was, but I didn't get a chance to look at it quickly, or, or, or rightly, I should say. But uh, I, they introduced the, the hate speech laws over there only, what, less than a week ago now, I think, at this stage. But I think after a couple of days, there was something like 3,800 cases lodged, I think, already in it. You know, so. It, it, it opens it up for abuse completely. Like, well, all you have to do is make an accusation against somebody, and, you know, that, that requires a, a, an investigation then. And I said, like, the powers that the Gardaí would have in relation to that then are so strong, like, that it leaves I said, yeah, everybody extremely vulnerable. It's, but, you're, but, you know, the sad thing about this is, is that, and, and, and this is kind of linked back to the media again, like, in one way, but it's, it's a case of we don't see any debates in relation to any of these bills that we've been trying to put forward. They just try and push them in under the carpet as fast as they can, like without mm -hmm. coming back to the public about it. They'll come out and they'll you know, they'll, they'll advertise it online so people get an opportunity to make submissions or whatever. But it, the reality of that is that people don't get involved in that. They don't come and make suspicions or submissions on, on this sort of legislation. You know, so it, it doesn't it doesn't become aware to people until a big public debate is opened up on it. So like in really and truly, what I'm saying here is that in every single piece of legislation they're trying to bring through like this, that's going to have such a, a detrimental or potentially detrimental impact on society, it should be wide open for debate. But see, they'll come along then, they'll tell you that you know it is that, that, that they'll bring the pros and the cons uh, to to the media, but but they don't really. And and I and I'm going to name a media source here, like right, and uh, and, and I don't mind saying it. Because it's, I think anybody that's ever watched the show, I think, will 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 be able to relate to what I'm saying here. Is if you look at the Tonight Show that we have on the television, I mean, we've continuously seen it where we would have somebody come along, maybe with well, Bill Bin, or not Bin, but uh, John McCork was actually one of the best examples I think I've seen that in a long time. But John McCork was on there a few weeks ago on Tonight Show, and the whole panel was lined up 
purposefully just to nail him. What mm -hmm. he was saying. There was no open debate like the panel was lined up to nail him. And they tried mm -hmm. their best to do it. But fair play to John McGurk said he's, he's actually a very intelligent man and was able to fight his corner. And he, and, and he came back out of that quite good. But that's the kind of debate we have on a lot of the media channels in this country. It's not open. Like, I don't care what it is that we're talking about, whether it be the hate speech laws or whether it be the, the what do you call it, the, the recent referendum we had. I could should be equal amounts and for, for pros and cons against it or, or for, or on the actual topic itself. And it shouldn't be just, you know, often what you'll see as well, Jerry, is they'll, they'll openly welcome, let's just say, oh, I don't know how I could describe this politely now, but uh, he'll, he'll often find that just say if the word, well, let's, let's say we're going with the hate speech bill, they'd find someone who would be kind of a little bit radical or a bit of a head case or whatever, like, right? And they'd, and they'd bring them on the show, knowing full well that they're going to be able to, you know, mutilate them mm -hmm. on the show. Whereas if they brought a, 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 an experienced person on, then it'd be a different story. Then you'd have even debate each side like. But that's, the media seem to be able to, you know, control everything that's going on. Well, yeah, yeah, well, like, we know that, like, like I suppose we're, we're, we're all, we're all becoming, we all, I think the whole country sees that now. One, one question I want to ask in, and, and maybe I'll go to Michael because he, he might know as much from meeting people on, on his post rounds. Have you seen or can you feel a, cha a, a massive change in the mood or the confidence of people on the ground since that no, no vote in the, you know, the, March eighth vote, um, Michael. Do you do you see that that's people, you know, that was such a huge kick in the teeth to the government. Are you seeing anything on the ground that that's had an effect with people? Well, I do. You know, the odd person, you know, it comes up in conversation, and they are just they were disgusted with it in the first hand that it was going ahead. They just thought it was craziness, and they're glad they're glad of the result that happened on the day. And that, that's the big thing that I hear of them. You know, I don't go into detail with them about anything. But, you know, when a conversation comes up, they just talk mm -hmm. about it. You know, they just talk it in general. And they are so glad what, what the result was. They are so glad. That's all I can say about it because that's all I've heard them saying about it. Okay. I suppose what, I, what I'm getting at there, maybe, Seamus, and we'll go to you, is that that was a seven in the country, that was a 70% no vote everywhere. Well, um, and yeah. I, I just want to add to this now. Just, I think, the, I think the country is seventy percent against everything we're talking about here. You know, Im you know the immigration, the you know the hate speech, a number of these issues. Well, okay, would you feel the well, same way? Yes. Well, number one, and we have to be very cognizant of the fact and recognize the fact that there are young people out there that have been abused online, who have taken their own life that have attempted to take their own life, that have been depressed because of it, have anxiety problems because of it, that their self-worth and self-confidence has gone because of abuse. So there's many forms of abuse out there which have to be stamped out. But the legislation has gone too far and going too far, and I think there will be more people abused as a result of the legislation. Now, this country, the, what I'm hearing on the ground and what I'm feeling on the ground People aren't happy. They aren't happy. The whole sex education thing in schools has gone too far. People don't like in national school the stuff that's been taught to their children. Mm -hmm. It's heavy. It's too much. I don't know. I don't think, I think there's got to be more thought put into it. I, I, I'm respecting everyone's view and I'm respecting everyone's position and no one could ever say anything about me that I was biased negatively about anything but it's like the this the equality the women's equality thing right let's say you have a counselor like Noel thomas 10 years experience very well versed in the problems that he has to face every day and let's say he went to a convention and because there had to be parity because of sex equality or whatever he had to step down off the ticket to let on a female who, who wouldn't have had his experience because of the sex issue right because you have to have 50 50 or whatever like, from that point of view, I think it's gone too far. I have never looked at one of my colleagues in Gorby County Council because of their sex or their attitude. And I viewed their utterances. I viewed the way they vote. I viewed their policies. I viewed how they operate and work with me. 
And the ladies in the Fianna Fáil team have worked as well with us as anybody else, and we have never had a problem there, you know. So, like, and I wouldn't like to think that the men have let them down either. So I think that the whole attitude has gone too far. And I definitely think that people's sexual orientation is, the, the, you know, it, that's abuse in itself to the people who don't want to be talking about those things. I think that's gone too far. When people on the ground don't like it, and they're not happy with the national school situation, they're very, very much so not happy. And it's the talk on the ground, and people are afraid to say it. You know, it's nearly like one of these dictatorships. It's a fascist thing. You're afraid now to open your mouth because you'll, you'll be done. Or, you know, somebody that it's affecting will create. And it appears that, as Noel has said before, and I'm saying it here, that minority groups, they gain traction. And because they're more vocal, like if you go back to any of the of, of the, the votes that you see, right, what's the turnout in Ireland now? 55% on, a, on an ordinary day, you know, you know, 30, 55%. So therefore half the population are making the decision. And now half that does again to wag the dog, if you like. So you're looking at 25% of the population can determine the future of the whole lot of us. Well, so, we're, we're and, and, and maybe even less. Would you, yeah, okay, and I'm glad that you No, see. no, but I mean, like, but yeah. just, from, just, just to pick up on something there, because really what I think we're getting, you know, the issue is on the trans ideology that's actually appearing in your school, your your national school, and it's 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 made its way through the political system in any shape, like your TDs or your local councillors don't know that it's happened and suddenly you're, you're, you're having teachers and parents says, what are they teaching my kids in school? There's been no national debate on stuff like this. So I think maybe is. Well, I, 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 I'm finding on the ground that people are very, very uneasy. Oh, about time. It has crept into the curriculum or that has crept, and the way. Now, if you go to the religious side of it, don't mind the sexual side of it, go to the religious side of it. Like there's stories out there that you can't have a picture of the Blessed Virgin hanging up anymore. You can't have the crib in certain places because you're offending somebody. Like, that's not right. Because if I went out to Saudi Arabia tomorrow morning, I wouldn't be expecting to take down or, or to, to to take down any of the effigies or whatever that the, the people have in their own country. And I also wouldn't be expecting to be putting up mine. And I don't think I'd be able to open a Catholic church abroad in Saudi Arabia that easy. And I just think that it's... I think that we're over... <sighs> tolerant is not the right word to use, because we should be tolerant, and we should be right to people. But I think we're bending backwards... And it's coming back to meters, and it will haunt us. I think it will haunt us. Well, uh, look, we bring all these. We bring all these. Um, I'm like we've we've introduced a few topics there. I'm probably more radical in a lot of them than y you are, and I I would. But I I, I like I frame it. Let, let me frame it like this. Do you see the situation at the moment, as I do, that we're in danger of losing the spirit and soul of our country? Um, that's been handed down to us generation by generation um, through famine, through war, through the whole lot of us, in that we'll, within 15 years, not have, or 20 years, not have a recognisably Irish country and the things that have been important as an Irish, you know, nation, you know, an, an Irish people. Um, like you bring up the, the, you know, the the picture of the Blessed Virgin and all that kind of stuff. But like, you know, our religion, our spirit, our soul is a part of who we are. And we, like a lot of the stuff we've been talking about puts that at risk. And do you see it that way? Or do you see it that way? What I see, just quickly, what I'd like to say there is, I'm a Catholic, but a devout Catholic, good Christian, yes. F materially devout, okay, mass once a month, God forgive me, I don't get there all the time. Yeah, but but I don't think that I'm a radical right-wing Christian. Or, or Catholic or whatever. Yeah. What I think is that the Irish people should be allowed their effigies, they should be allowed to have their statues, they should be allowed to have what they believe in, they should be allowed to have their religion. And in the same way, any other faith should be entitled to have theirs without imposing your will. So saying that to prop the crib at Christmas time is offensive to a certain section of a migrant community, God help us, is that what has happened to us? Well, that's part of who we are, and I, I'll just bring you, Noel, in on that one. You see, Jerry, I got to disagree with you on that. It's not part of who we are. It's part of something that we are being forced into being. No, no, no. I mean, this stuff that's being brought in is not part of who we are. No, it's like, not. And, and it puts all, it puts all, it puts the future generations of this country in dangerous, in danger, like, of, you know, losing that link with the past and lo and the spirit of the country. That's what I mean, like. That's you know it, I mean? Yeah, and you're right. Because I can tell you one thing, Jerry. If we keep going the way we're going, we, we're going to lose that link completely. 
Yeah. Absolutely and utterly. The only place you're going to be left with that link in this country is on a is with a tour guide going around with a bunch of tourists at some stage telling them the stories of what Ireland used to be once upon a time. That's all that'll be left there. For some reason, we are always the best students in the class for Europe. And every single thing, every diktat that comes from Europe, we're the first ones to jump in there and to be the best at doing what we're told. So that's 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 the way we've, we've, we've been doing it all along. Like. So like, I, I honestly just don't understand it. It frustrates me to see it. Like, like you spoke there earlier on yourself about you know, this whole uh, transgender issue and the you've got the you know, all these pronoun rubbish that people is going on with at the moment too like you have to describe yourself now as a he him or a she her or an ish or whatever the hell it is like like it's completely out of hand like and i can tell you like you see people will come along there and they'll say to me you know you're homophobic you're whatever whatever else you might be like right but like there could be nothing further from the truth like i've, I've no some uh, homosexual couples and, and 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 people around the area here myself they were the finest people that you could ever meet yeah and, but they're separate like that is like well, uh, uh, that's is. totally separate like to me yeah, like no, that's we're like, that we, we, not happy yeah. with what's going on either that's how far yeah. we've pushed it you know what i'm saying man? like yeah. we're, we're 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 just making a mess of the hands of the whole thing man. Mm -hmm. well yeah. that's my my view anyway is like it's simple enough right ireland is ireland and we should be still able to uh to carry on it's shameless of itself there a while ago look we've seen that the hospitals you know, because there's a huge amount of staff in our hospitals, which is great to see, and we need them. You know, have the, that are migrants working there and everything else like that. But they came to our country to work. So they should be tolerable of whatever we have in place in this country. We should not be changing anything in our country, like removing statues from the hallways or anything else to suit somebody else. Like, well, no, I hear all I said to you there in the health services. Like, and, you know, this is one way area that, I, you know, I think we need to, you know, to think about a lot is our health service is infused with um you know people from different countries in it at the same time our young people who are qualifying as nurses and young doctors are leaving the country to go to australia new zealand and that because they can't afford you know to live here on that the, on on what they might get paid and we have this kind of dystopian view of the world where we have a a fallen birth rate in this country for 15 years the the youth that are here are actually going out the door for you know a lot of them will come back i'm not saying they won't but we have a situation where we have tens of thousands of young irish people qualified leaving the country and hundred like it's not just me dan o'brien came out with this last week Two hundred and fifty thousand people came into the country in 2022 five percent of the population is that like we have to you know we have to incentivize our protect our youth that are qualified and kind of and stop again, them leaving. And again, Jerry, look at this again, it goes back again to one of the reasons that, I, that would have attracted me again back to the likes of Independent Ireland. Because Independent Ireland has spoken strongly on this issue as well. And what they want to do is they want to see incentives brought in here. So, in other words, you, you spoke about it there a while ago. Like, we've got people who uh, head off to college up to Dublin or Wicklow or, or sorry, uh, Limerick or wherever else they go, right, to study for, say, to be teachers or to be nurses or doctors or whatever else it might be they're doing. And, uh, like, what we should be doing here is, as a government is giving them incentives, right, helping them out first for accommodation, you know, whether, wherever they're in college, and then afterwards, like, if you can offer a package to them, say, that you're going to make their accommodation life very easy for them and affordable, that then you would have a, a, a package in place for them then that they, in, in return for that, that they would actually stay and work in this country afterwards for, for X amount of years, but on proper pay conditions as well. And, and it said to you, like, you're providing affordable accommodation for them along that way as well. That's the only way you're going to keep people here, because you said it yourself a minute ago. Like, it's not, it's not viable for them to stay here. I mean, I have a daughter myself. But they're not prior, but no, the other thing is the political part, the political establishment have prior prioritized, have not prioritized their needs. They've oh, yeah. put the needs yeah. of other, like, I'm, and like, we, we won't, I could get into the Ukraine and the asylum seeker stuff and could say, you know, we could go down the road that a lot of these are economic migrants, in fact. Um, like a good percentage of them. I'm not saying that some a, a good percentage aren't fleeing from war, but there's a good percentage here that are economic migrants. Their priorities have been put above 
Irish young Irish people's prioritizing young Irish people for four years and going back to the COVID, you know, even the COVID era and stuff like that. Um, so will what you, do I what do Independent Ireland propose on that? Well, we don't know. We don't know because we're, we're joining a new party, but we're joining with individuals that we know of old. And I know, okay, and I don't want to deify Michael Fitzmaurice overnight. He was on the council with us. We were good friends. Look, he, he was okay, but he was quite like, I'm not going to get into the COVID stuff here, but he no, was quiet during COVID. You no, know, he I was quiet for most of COVID. Yeah, yeah but with respect, I just want to make this point. With regard okay, to okay, you. go ahead. Yeah, when, when Michael Fitzmaurice was on Galway County Council, remember, he was looking as an independent at all crowd of Fianna Fathers. So we couldn't have really been his friend, even though I always class him as a friend and he's a great character and a great politician and, and a great man for his people and he speaks the truth. So from the point of view of when I am out of Fianna Fáil, you know, he's a man that talks the kind of language I want to listen to. My, yeah, I tend to agree. And, and, and I'm, I'm relying on him as a senior man because, first of all, he got elected as all Ireland, something I wasn't able to do. Right? I, first of all, I wouldn't get on the ticket. Because we have a strong Galway West TD in Fianna Fáil, and that's all. There's only room for one because there's only enough to vote one Fianna Fáil in. But we're reality stakes here, right? So we're aligning we're aligning ourselves to a known entity that we know whose heart is in the game and whose skin is in the game because he needs to get elected like the rest of us. So I kind of see him changing his policies and leaving us in the lurch. Now, what would happen if the party and you see? Who is behind Independent Ireland is another question then. Who is organising it? Who who began the, the, the nucleus, the idea of doing it? I don't know. I don't know who's in HQ. I know the lady that's dealing with us. Well, now, let me just put it to you there. Now, we have to stop there because that's a headline. Um, if you don't know, like, shouldn't you know? Well, I know that the three TDs that I met, you see, this is the point I'm making to you, that I have to deal yeah. from me. I, I'm only, I'm not a, um, how would I call it, a professor of politics or anything, but I'm making this point here, that I was asked to attend a meeting in Athlone, I attended it, very impressed, three TDs, I knew the three of them, well I knew two of them, one, because I, Michael of course I'd know very well, right, and the lady that's dealing with us, very much so, mm -hmm. very impressed. And that is Elaine Mullally. Yes, no, very, very you don't want to be naming people. You know, well she, no, you can't, hold on now, hold on. She's yeah. she's oh, she's oh, a named yeah. she's a named yes, founder yeah. of the party, so she is. Well, well, I she want is to so now, so now I attend a meeting, right? And I meet Elaine, and I meet Mark, and I meet the three TDs, and I meet t councillors that I have known for years. Mm. That I got on very well with, and always got on very well with. So I didn't see any enemies there, if you like, right? Oh, and I didn't yeah. see any enemies in my policies. So okay. So they put forward policies up there on the screen. And what I was told by Michael Smaris now, and I'm believing him, and I'll stay with him until I find otherwise. Yes. He said that we're gathering it's nearly like a co-op, if he didn't use that word, but it's gathered, we're gathering in a gang of independence. And we're not going to have a whip per se. And you're still going to have your own independence. Naturally enough, if you're breaking the law on something, you're going to go, and rightly so, mm. right? But, so we are coming together as a group to work together to gain traction. And in the main, this is what we're for. And I agreed with what we were for, and I've read it, and I, I like it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, you know, in this discussion early on, if half an hour ago, you know, you put it to us, like, what would happen here, what would happen there? We actually don't know. Because remember, the PD started, and Desi O'Malley started with the PDs, and he was going to do great things, and, and Fianna Fáil were his enemy, and the whole shebang, and Fianna Fáil was corrupt. So the first thing he did was go into government for Fianna Fáil. No, like, no, but, and I'm not saying he did anything wrong or anything. He was a great politician. In his day. No, but like it was the, the no. but what I would say it was a decision that, that, that stunted his own growth, probably. Of course, you know it, did. Of course it did. But maybe at the time, in his lifespan, and in his political lifespan, maybe he felt that he could achieve something that was close to his political being that he wanted to do. Now, I know that Michael Fitzmaurice, like myself, feels that the SSEs, although they're a necessary good, right, because they protect our environment, right? So they're, they're a certain good, but they're not all good. The mapping was wrong. A lot of the bogs issues was wrong. A lot of the planning issues for us, for example, the road between Mam Cross and Clifton refused planning permission. 
it was refused planning permission because of DSACs, because concerns about DSACs. So, just to, what is the SSACs again? Just okay. areas of conservation, and that's you know, okay. yeah, yeah. you can't cut your turf, raised bogs, SSCs for raised bogs. For us, we cannot do much around the Uchtraird area, and even the footbridge for the children is held up badly from the schools. I mean, you know, in Uchtraird, the, the badly needed pedestrian crossing bridge in Uchtraird has been held up because if we were to dirty the river, we might kill this pearl mussel, who is part of one of the SSC, you know, directives, we'd say, from Europe that came to protect this guy, right? And protect him by all means, but protect him in, in, in a logical manner. So what I'm saying is, that the Michael Fismaris ethos on special areas of conservation parallels well with mine. Um, what I felt frustrated about, that when Michael was a new councillor on the council, and me maybe having 10 years done before him or something, I, I tried, I'd been there, you see, and I'd, I tried to change SSEs and found our national legislation. But Michael has now become a national politician and has been for some time. And he's in there where it's working. Now, I just, I, yeah, now yeah. I, there's somebody in Leinster House that thinks like I think. Okay, he's to, and he's trying to drum up enough of support to get into a position in power with the government where he can relax all those laws on his people. The people of North Galway, out into Roscommon, the people of Connemara have the same problems with SSEs. They were mapped incorrectly. They're being overimposed, and we're not being listened to. He's not asking to do anything. Well, I believe he's not asking to do anything improper. He's asking to get a bit of common sense into the thing. But well, here's the but Seamus now just to just to stop you there for a sec. A lot of this is coming in from Europe. You know, these are a lot of this is European directives. And I just want to give you an example because I was driving between Spiddle and my Cullen going across the mountains there, and you have the forest. Our home and, and there and there was the scene. I, I was came over the brow of a hill and there was a scene and it was like a a, a symbol of the times. It was an old rusted tractor with a trailer on top of a bog, and I'd say it could have been sitting there for five years. And in the background was the forests and all these wind farms. Yeah. And I thought, well, which, <laughs> is that not like, is that not a metaphor for what's happened to Connemara? And like, I don't know what, you, you know, you, you talk about special areas of conservation is like, Jesus, they're so, like, you see yeah. these massive wind farms and our... that's the frustration. Jerry, that's the frustration that I know that Michael Smaris feels. And I kind of speak for him, he's achieved more than I ever will. Well, in my own area, I've achieved a lot as well, planning for people in that. But but I'm just saying nationally and policy-wise. Mm -hmm. But for like-minded people like him, Noel, myself, Michael, who I know Michael for since 1987. Hmm. Michael hasn't done himself justice as far as he told you about policy because he was my right hand man back in 1999, 98 when I ran. Mm -hmm. And he has been involved in my campaigns. But, so, I mean, we're seasoned politicians here in front of you. Oh, he, absolutely. I'm not like, I'm not questioning you personally. What, what, what I mean is, what I mean is, we're coming together. We're burying all hatchets. We're letting all small, petty jealousy about votes and all that go out the window. And we're trying to give it one lash for this year and for the general election to see are we able to get that bit of traction to get that grappling hook into the government and say, can you do something for our people to relax your crazy laws? Can you just do something that makes sense? Can you try and help the young people have a house? Can you try, for example, there's a big park planned for years. There's a million and a half spent in the last planning application and it was refused. It should have been rammed through. There shouldn't even be a thought about it. They're doing a, a major innovative park for marine biology and research in Kilkiron in Kerna. But because Irish water wouldn't guarantee enough water was one of the main reasons it was being refused. And the other one was they couldn't prove that they wouldn't drain out the bogs when they'd be taking the water that they needed from the lake. So in other words, if we had a source of water, we wouldn't be draining the lake and this would have gone ahead. One million and a half spent on planning. People still waiting for jobs in a deprived area, in a population decline area, in a claw area, where everybody is jumping up and down saying they're trying to help, in a guilt area where they're trying to save the Irish language. Mm -hmm. And it's all being lost over red, tape. Jerry, red tape. Just during relation to where you were talking about there, that, that road you, you travelled out from Spittle to my calling, like it's the road I, I travel myself regularly, I'm not far away from it. But uh, 
There's an awful injustice there in relation to uh, the likes of these large developments of uh, wind turbines and all out in these scenic areas, right? But but if you actually sit down and you study the maps first, or you'll soon find out that everywhere those wind turbines are uh, actually built, they're, they're not in SACs. But all around them, uh, all around them is an SAC, but somehow, magically, the bits of land in between are left, or not SAC. But I mean, but when I talk about injustices here is, I mean, you book that road you travelled on, and you take, take a right-hand turn coming from my column, and I can tell you a story there about a, a, a person who, who had to build, who wanted to build a house there. And uh, this is going back a few years ago before they actually put the turbine up there. So in order for her to build the house where she wanted to build on the site, she, uh, they, they said that there was going to be a negative visual impact from the house. So she had to spend tens of thousands of euros in rock breaking into the side of a, of a mountain in order to be able to screen her house a little bit more. And she done it. And built the house at, at an enormous cost line. And then to see a few years later, right across the road from her, a 150 meter or 140 meter turbine built, mm-hmm. and no talk at all about visual impact. You know, this is this is the kind well, of this is but, but this is like you know, you're saying work with government, and it's like I, I like I very much feel you need to fight with the next government if you're not part like if you're not part of it, like hard, because it's again an example where there's one rule for what the state owns and there's another rule for what private people uh, on private property are, are allowed to do. You know? book injury is not awful easy on all this sort of stuff. Like, I mean, I've seen developments going ahead there, right? There might be close to a, a an ordinary enough river, say, or whatever. It wouldn't have very high status or whatever. And uh, they'll be nailed. That there, that there, that there, there wouldn't be uh, adequate treatment uh, facilities to be able to, co- to, to deal with the, the effluent coming out or whatever. Now, we talked earlier on about Uktvard. Uktvard's sewage system. It's, it's, it, it, uh, it sends its, uh, its, its effluent, the, the runoff in the end goes out into the Owner River. Mm-hmm. Right? So a brand new treatment plant built only, what was it, Seamus, three, four years ago, was it? Five years uh, ago? It could be yeah. changed now. Like, uh, 10 well, years ago, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, a few years ago, it was built, right? Yeah. And like, they were all very well well aware at the time like that this is a, one of the most important rivers in the country to protect this pearl mussel, and then it's going into a, a Salmonide River, and then it's going into an SAC Lake, the car. And, and that particular plant was allowed to be built to a secondary treatment standard. So you've, you've got primary treatment first, which just takes out most of the solids, right? Then you've got secondary treatment, which takes out the solids and then treats a, a, a little slight bit of the bacterial treatment, you could say, and stuff like that. Not. And then you've got tertiary treatment, which is the cream of the crop. But you'd imagine that's no way that they should have been allowed to do anything else other than tertiary there. But the EPA guidelines say they can. So like, what I'm trying to point I'm making on this, Jerry, is, is that like we've got the government, then we've got the EPA. But the two of them don't seem to be connecting with each other at all. Well, no, I think like the like there's ten- in order to, to go ahead with developments that shouldn't be going ahead of. Yeah, well, I think a lot of policy, and you're going to probably find, like, if if any of you run in the general election and are successful, um, like you're you're going to see an awful lot of policies being dri- is not origin is not originating out of the soul of the political system. It's being foisted in from you know thirty thousand NGOs and European directives and. There's a mountain of legislation, and I suppose it's through that that there's no fight back. Like, with, there needs to be a massive fight back to that. Yeah. Some of this stuff. You have to start pushing back, Joy, on this kind of stuff. Because yeah, absolutely, but like that's what I'm saying for two years. Like back in 1998, I think it was the first time. Like, like oh, just, just first. Like, every single area is different. And, and that nobody tells anything any different than that. That we all know it ourselves. Like, like you go to Connacht is very different to 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 Ulster to Leinster. You know what I mean? And and Galway is very different to to Roscommon. You know, there's this huge difference between every area you go to. So mm. back in 1998 was one of the best examples I've seen of this when they tried to bring in the regional assemblies over in England. And uh, basically, that goes. It's a policy basically that one size fits all. Again, they split the area into I don't know how many regional assemblies they set up in England. There was, was a few of them, four or five of them, I think, whatever. The only one of those to date that is still in place is the Regional Assembly of London City. Because you can understand that. London City is a big city, one size fits all there. They've done the same thing here in Ireland, and they actually still have those Regional Assemblies in place now. Like we don't seem to learn from the lessons from other countries at all. And we're going down the same path here. And eventually it'll probably fall apart here again, as I said, because we're not recognising at all that every area is different. And like that's that's the most important lesson we should get. Every co- like you you know every every county is different in Ireland. Like do you know, yeah, and you and individual and... policies for every single area as well. That's what we should have. 
Michael, I want to bring you back in there because I have a question because Connemara, you know, growing up as I did and the Irish language, Connemara was the stronghold of our national language um, in the country. Um, how do you feel the Irish language is faring, uh, Michael, in the last 20 years? You know, we've seen loads of investment into the Irish language. We've seen we've TG4 cited out in Connemara. Um, do you think we're making headway in that battle to preserve our language or not? I must say, honestly, I think there's a big decline in a bit of speaking of the Irish language because there's no doesn't seem to be any interest in it as much anymore. When I was growing up, everybody was speaking Irish around me, but it was more that time there was the population that's in Connemara now. And with all the people that have moved in, and no disrespect to them, they've looked, they've tried to learn it, but it seems that the Irish language itself is fading away. Now we have great summer schools in Connemara, and it draws in a big, huge thing for the Connemara area. But now you're going back, you're talking about we have no accommodation for the parents when they come down to, to visit their children on the weekend. So a lot of them have to just drop, come on a Saturday. Saturday morning, see them for a few hours and head back to Dublin or wherever they're going to go. But uh, I find myself, I'm in a lot of towns, little towns now in Connemara, that the Irish speaking language is fading. And I'm, and I well, I remember it well because I, you know, I used to go out with someone from Carraro, and Carraro will say it was a totally Irish speaking town back in the 90s. Yeah. And to the point where they would not talk in English, like, you know, they, they would not talk in English to you, like, um, <laughs> at all, if they could. And I very much, you know, at the time, it's annoying. But when you look now, it's like, that was the only way to preserve the language, is that it had to be the spoken yeah. language of the village. Yes, I don't get the sense that those ties are as strong around Connemara now. And I suppose the further closer to Galway you get, the probably looser, looser they are. Would you find that, um, no? That's it. Or Michael, whichever. He's a no. Um, that is very accurate what you're after saying there. Very, very accurate. I find myself, I'm a, I find it with my own children. I, I, they were brought up through Irish all the time. All the time. And I find when they just meet with their friends, automatically they just start talking English for no reason. And it vexes me, to be honest with you. And there's a lot of parents of my own age and older that it vexes them to why just they just do they change? I just do not know. I and suppose, when they come yeah. back to me or to my wife, it's Irish straight away then again. I just don't know. And that's the God's honest truth now on that one. What do you have you any views on that? Because I suppose technology is playing a lot of parts because kids are that are spending well, so much time on their phones. Okay, I was elected in ninety nine to the council and that time the Connemara area meetings were held mainly to Irish. Wow, okay. They were they were really and truly they were mainly to Irish and she you never hear a word of Irish not spoken no, at, no. at our area meeting. No. You know, it, it's it's oh it's a big change. But when when I was on the council first, it was a different council. The dual mandate hadn't been abolished. So like I sat in with Sean O'Yachton, who later went on to be an MEP, you had Kanye Niaharta, you had Seamus Gavin, do you know? There were there were well, of course, I Shukuk, knew. Shukuk, I'd say. Shukuk, came yeah. after that, yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I, oh. I, I, what, what, would be, what would be one thing you do to try and improve that scenario? Is there is there any single thing that you think, any of you, I will open it to any, that would help to kind of restore, you know, the 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 language or the the spoken use of the language? Not even the, you know, not the academic use of it, but rather the spoken use of it. If I can come in on that. And it yeah. comes back to planning permission again <clears throat> for the local people that who are who have brilliant Irish and that would put it at another stage again. They can't get planning permission. So what they're doing, they're very well educated. They're heading off to Australia. They're heading off to England and other places because for the simple reason they can't build a house on their own land in Connemara. And mm -hmm. that is the long and the short of it. And that's okay. why they are going... And that's just it. And the Irish language is dying because of that. Because we were talking about the Irish students. They'd, they'd hold Irish students. They would teach them. They A lot of the students that come, they learn as much with the family at home than they do at the colleges. And it's, the colleges do great, great things. 
but they're listening to the to the people of the house, the fire and tea expanity, talking naturally. It's not out of a book. It's just natural. And they have after two or three weeks, they can sit down and have a conversation with you. And they are so happy leaving. But that's mm -hmm. what's happening when the young crowd, the young generation can't build a house on their own land. And mm -hmm. that is a huge problem. And where I come from, Russell Beale and back the, the islands and Ah, yeah, yeah. That's uh, I know that part of the lads. Um, I suppose we're going longer than expected, an hour and twenty. But look, um, is there anything? Is there anything? Is there anything you want to finish up with, lads, or to to to, to get out there? And I'll give each of you a minute or two if you want. To I just, um, just, 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 just back on the Irish language thing, just quickly, if you don't mind. Look, and I'm not from get the theory myself. I'm originally from Roscahill, right? So we it wasn't to get the theory, so. I'm not a Gwail Gummer self, unfortunately, because it's also that it's, it's something I'd, I'd love to have the Irish language if I could, but I, I, I just unfortunately I don't have it. I have a few words like I can make a mess of this all, for, all together for you, but like, you know, Tisha Medini, Conchesca, King of May, Glor, Fokla Dorchi, that Nero Gay Goggles, and that's the unfortunate part of it, like. And that's probably a poor attempt at what I was trying to say. No, 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 no. It's, it's, you know, in other words, like, I, I, you know, I can get a lot. So, like, someone have a conversation in Aspelga, I'll, I get the gist of what they're saying, but, you know, unfortunately, I just don't have it, have it very strongly. But uh, there's another dangerous side to that, you see, Jerry, as well. Like, you go back to, see a, a rural uh, Gwilgor village, like, and, uh, like, you know, we talk about how, how we try to encourage the, the the Irish language to be used more there, but at the same time, you know, if 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 a, if a village is to prosper, the population has to grow, and 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 everything else with it has to grow as well. And you know, if 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 you can't get enough of a local population, you know, that's that's, that's building up in an area too, it becomes, you know, if you don't want to see an area. They're well, what I would say is like there's, a, I think there's there's special areas of Connemara, and I'm thinking back the islands and in Carrow. Like I don't think you should, like personally speaking, I don't think you should be allowed to move in there without a a, a de like a very a concentrated um, education in the Irish language to become yeah, part of the community. Like Just, you know, not I'm not saying all of Connemara because there's parts of Connemara that don't have the same the same. Yeah. Strength in the language as others, but you know, yeah. going Mark, back out, Spiegel, yeah. Carro, the islands that yeah. it, that was historically all yeah. Irish speaking as recently as 20 years ago, like in my experience. Can if you don't mind, I'll finish up. Try first, yeah. but, uh, in relation to what we were talking about earlier on, there you were, Joe, you were, you were having a good, big discussion there in relation to you know why we are joining up with, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But you, what you've got to understand from this, from our perspective at this particular point in time, it's it's like a leap of faith for us. Right. We've 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 found a party that we believe to be the party that's going to bring policies forward into the future. There's, that are policies that, 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 that we are okay with, like, and that's that's why we've we've we've, we've signed up with them. Okay, but, but we're also very much aware, and I know it's something that I've thought about myself a lot over the last uh, couple of months is that the difficulties of a whole lot of indep independent people together. Right. It's you know it it could be it could be a, a case that you know it could be difficult enough to for everybody to stick together strongly on on particular issues and that's mm -hmm. that's the only fear that I have in relation to this. But the only the only the only thing that gives me a bit of comfort on that at the moment is is that everybody now that is joining the party they're seeing the basis of the policies that we're putting forward. So you'd be hoping that you know that they're coming on board, you know, for that reason. Well, that's why I wanted to interview the three together is to give to give people a flavor of you know what you're about. Do you know what but I mean? Let's, like, be, yeah. let's be honest, Jerry. Let's be honest about this. Like we've all we all said it now here today, and we've been saying it for a long time. There are serious, serious changes needed in this country at present. Hundred right? percent. Yeah. Independent Ireland, on its own, probably won't be strong enough at this particular point. Maybe will in the future. But it probably won't be strong enough at this particular point to make any major changes yet. And I do think myself that into the future, I think that there's, 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 a, there's other groupings that are being formed at the moment even now that I think that have, have similar say, beliefs, and beliefs and policies and everything else that we'd have as well. And he'd be hoping to see that, that for the good of the country, that they've merged together at some stage and be able to work together in order to make these changes that we all want so badly. Yeah, no, thanks. And like, like I appreciate, you know, from my point of view, just looking at it from the outside is when I'm looking at something. I, I is you're you're looking to see the foundation or or the people 
getting the foundations of it right. So that's why some of the questions back and forth are, 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 are to try and get that information for myself. Seamus, do you have anything final you want to say about about yourself and your, well, and your candidacy okay. with our independent yeah. Ireland? Right. So if I, I stand on today and I look at the government, we say we are trying to get infrastructure built in Connemara, and one of the main pieces we're trying to build at the minute, we're trying to get a connection just between, just call it between Mount Cross and Uptra now. It's a bit of a done. It's four kilometres of a done, right? But it's been held up, we're being told, because agreement can be reached between the National Parks and Wildlife and the Council. And if you were to ask the question, who's the minister in charge of both of them? The Minister for Local Government, Dara O'Brien. Now, our local representatives, TDs, the five in Galway West, are there every day in Dal Airden. Surely to God, Dara O'Brien is able to bring the National Parks and Wildlife and the Council together and form a solution. There's this laissez-faire thing that a, a department that, what would I call it, a section of a department, which is the National Parks and Wildlife, and the other section, local government, which is, covers Galway County Council. That they're under the same minister. The minister is trying to build the road with the council, and he's trying to stop it with the National Parks and Wildlife. I find it very frustrating. Look, again, I don't know that Daryl Breen is, you know, to me, he's no, not... It's not it's, it's, no, it's, it's, no, but like, I, like I'm just, I'll, I'll make this comment on him. He, the, he minister isn't. Is the, road, and the minister is building the road and stopping the road at the same time. Yeah, and you know, they, do you know what they're saying? The buck stops with me. The buck stops with the minister. Well, absolutely. You are a minister in Dal uh, uh, you know, accountable to us. Well, not to me anymore, but accountable to me because I'm still a, a member of the Irish electorate. And to think that he's trying to build a road using Garbage County Council, but he's actually stopping it as well using the National Parks of My Life. Yeah, well, that doesn't surprise me that the, the, the left hand the left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing. And, what yeah. is he on? Well, look at he's <laughs> he's definitely not on the same planet as me. Anyway, Michael, I, I want to finish up with you now and tell me um, a little bit about um, what you're hoping over the next couple of weeks or what you're going to be uh, campaigning on. Well, I'm just going. I'm going to be honest at the doors. I'm, they're going to say, "What are you going to do for me?" That's the first question they ask. What could they do for me? And I'll say, "I'll do my best." But I say, I'm going to say there's a lot of barriers that I have to climb over to help you but between red tape and silly things, just silly things. But as I promised there, everybody was talking to, I will do the, my best and, this, and try very, very hard to help you get the simple things in life that you should be entitled to have without this red tape that's, that's making a heaps of everything that we're trying to do. Okay. Lads, we'll leave it at that and I appreciate your time and you've had a busy day with the announcement and all, all of that and I wish you well, genuinely speaking, in the weeks and months ahead and I'll just end the stream now and we're...